Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to, uh, please be seated. Uh, Attorney General Janet Reno will be acknowledging um, some of our uh, distinguished uh, guests from the law enforcement community. I would like to, uh, before introducing the President, acknowledge uh, distinguished guests from the House and Senate. Uh, I'd like to especially single out uh, the two chairmen uh, here, uh, Congressman Jack Brooks and Senator Joe Biden, uh, both of whom have worked uh, for uh, many long years uh, in behalf of stronger law enforcement. I'd like to uh, acknowledge Senator Frank Lautenberg, uh, Senator Bill Cohen, uh, Senator Larry Pressler, Congressman John Conyers, uh, Congressman Chuck uh, Schumer, uh, and other uh, distinguished guests. Have I missed anyone? I don't think so. All right. Last week, uh, we broke 12 years of gridlock in reducing spending and getting our economy moving again. Today, we're here to break gridlock again with a united bipartisan front against crime and gun violence. The American people have been kept waiting long enough. They want more police on the street and fewer guns. They want the Brady Bill and the Crime Bill, and we're going to pass them into law. It's high time. Across the country, people live in fear of getting beaten or mugged or shot. Little children worry about gangs and drugs and knives in the hallways at school. Government's first duty is to keep its citizens safe. And it's time that Washington went to work with every city and town in America to help make our people feel safe again. I've, worked, I've had the privilege of working with Chairman Jack Brooks in the House of Representatives and Chairman Joe Biden in the United States Senate to help pass the Brady Bill and the Crime Bill. When Bill Clinton, Janet Reno, Jack Brooks, Joe Biden, and their colleagues stand together on these issues, you can bet we'll be back here in the Rose Garden very soon to sign this legislation into law. Pres <laughs> President Bill Clinton is committed to reducing gun violence and putting 100,000 police officers on the street. It's my pleasure at this time to introduce the President of the United States, President Bill Clinton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President, Madam Attorney General, uh, distinguished members of the Congress and the law enforcement community, and concerned American citizens. I'm glad to have all of you here in the Rose Garden today for this important announcement. I want to say a special word of appreciation to Senator Biden and to Chairman Brooks, who've worked for a long time to try to get a good crime bill through the United States Congress. I hope today is the beginning of that. I'm proud to be here with representatives of the nation's police and prosecutors and state's attorneys general, with whom we have worked closely to fashion this bill. And it gives me particular pressure to be here with some of the brave men and women who risk their lives every day to protect the people of this country and to preserve the law. The first duty of any government is to try to keep its citizens safe. But clearly, too many Americans are not safe today. We no longer have the freedom from fear for all our citizens that is essential to security and to prosperity. The past four years have seen 90 thousand murders in this country. Last month in this city, our nation's capital, in one week, 24 murders were committed. When our children must pass through metal detectors to go to school or worry that they'll be the victim of random drive-by shootings when they're playing in the swimming pool in the summertime, when parents are imprisoned in their own apartments behind locked doors, when we can't walk the streets of our cities without fear, we have lost an essential element of our civilization. Many of you have heard me tell many times over the last year and a half or so of the immigrant worker in the New York Hotel who said that if I became president, he just wanted me to make his son free. And when I asked him what he meant, he meant that his son couldn't walk to school two blocks without his walking with him. His son couldn't play in the park across the street from their apartment house without his father being there. He said his son was not free. It's time we put aside the divisions of party and philosophy and put our best efforts to work on a crime plan that will help all the American people and go beyond the cynicism of mere speeches 
to clear action. Today, I'm proud to be here with the chairs of the House and the Senate Judiciary Committees to announce this plan. The plan is not as tough, it is fair, it will put police on the street and criminals in jail. It expands the federal death penalty. It let criminals know that if they are guilty, they will be punished. It lets law-abiding citizens know that we are working to give them the safety they deserve. It is the beginning, just the beginning, but a major beginning of a long-term strategy to make America a more law-abiding, peaceful place and to make Americans more secure and to give our young people, wherever they live, a better chance to grow up to learn, to function, to work, and to have a decent life. This bill first addresses the most pressing need in the fight against crime. There simply are not enough police officers on the beat. The plan is designed to make the major down payment on the pledge that I made in the campaign to put 100,000 police officers on the street. Thirty years ago, there were three police officers for every violent crime. Today, the ratio is reversed, three crimes for every police officer. Like so many of the best ideas, community policing was spawned in the laboratories of experimentation on the streets of our cities and towns. Then Commissioner Lee Brown of New York, now my drug director, sent some 3,000 additional police officers onto the streets of New York City, launching community policing in every precinct. Then shortly thereafter, for the first time in 36 years, crime rates went down in every major category. It's worked from Boston to St. Louis to Los Angeles. The crime bill that will be introduced next month will include $3.4 billion to fund up to 50,000 new police officers to walk the beat. It will also create a police corps to give young people money for college, train them in community policing, and ask them to return to their communities to serve as police officers in return for their education. This will add to the numerous community policing initiatives we have already undertaken. For example, earlier this year, I signed a jobs bill that will make $150 million available right away to hire or rehire police officers. And I'm happy to report that the Labor Department will allocate $10 million to retrain newly discharged troops from the United States Armed Forces to become police officers. After defending our freedom abroad, they'll be given a chance to do so at home. Second, we must end the insanity of being able to buy or sell a handgun more easily than obtaining a driver's license. The Brady Bill, which requires a waiting period before the purchase of a handgun, is simply common sense. I have said so before Congress and before the American people. It is long past time to pass it. If the Congress will pass it, I will sign it. I believe now the Congress will pass it. There is no conceivable excuse to delay this action one more day. The effort to keep handguns out of the hands of criminals cannot and should not wait for the passage of this legislation. Today, I will sign two presidential directives that fight gun violence. I am ordering that the rules governing gun dealers be reviewed to make sure that only legitimate gun dealers are in the business of selling guns. And I, <clears throat> and I am ordering the Treasury Department to take the necessary action to suspend the importation of foreign-made assault pistols, which have become the weapons of choice for many gangs and drug dealers. Too many weapons of war are making their way onto our streets and turning our streets into war zones. Let me also say that this effort against crime will not be complete if we do not eliminate assault weapons from our street. No other nation would tolerate roving gangs stalking the streets better armed than the police officers of a country. Why do we do it? We shouldn't, and we ought to stop it. Finally, if we are to take back the streets of America from the gangs and the drug dealers, we must do what has not been done before. We must actually enact a crime bill. This legislation will be introduced by Chairman Biden and Brooks, and it will build upon a lot of good ideas from around the country, including one I worked hard on when I was governor, community boot camps for young offenders, boot camps which give young people the discipline, the training, the treatment they need for a second chance to build a good life. When it comes to hardened, violent criminals, society has the right to impose the most severe penalties, but I believe we should give young people a chance to make it. As I said during the campaign and as I 
said during my tenure as a governor, I support capital punishment. This legislation will reform procedures by limiting death row inmates to a single habeas corpus appeal within a six-month time limit, but also guaranteeing them a higher standard of legal representation than many have had in the past. Both elements are important if this is to be genuine reform. And it will provide the death penalty for some federal offenses, including killing a federal law enforcement officer. As I said, this is just the beginning of our efforts to restore the rule of law on our streets. To do this, we must work with thousands of law enforcement officials around the country who risk their lives every day. We must work with the mayors, with the governors. We must work with the people who deal with children before they become criminals. We must have a broad-based assault on the terrible things that are rending the fabric of life for millions of Americans. But we in Washington must work together, too. For too long, crime has been used as a way to divide Americans with rhetoric. It is time, and I thank the Republican members of Congress who are here today, it is time to use crime as a way to unite Americans through action. I call on the Democrats and the Republicans together to work with us and with the law enforcement community to craft the best possible crime legislation. Last week, we began to break the gridlock with a new budget and an economic plan. Now we can do so again in ways that unite us as Americans. And I pledge to you my best and strongest efforts to pass this bill at the earliest possible time. There are good things in it. It will make our people safer. It will shore up our police officers. It will move America in the right direction. May I now introduce a person who has done a great deal to do all those things just in the last few months, our distinguished Attorney General, Janet Reno. Thank you, Mr. President. It is a pleasure to be here with so many people who are on the cutting edge, both in the streets of America, in our courthouses, in our state houses, and in Congress, to really begin to address what we can do about crime in America. As a former local prosecutor, I understand how difficult the issues are on the streets. That's where the real problems develop. That's where the police have the hardest job of anybody involved in this effort and we need to do something to actually support them and stop talking about it. We need to form a partnership between federal, state, and local law enforcement so that one side isn't telling the other what to do, but we're working on it together. We've got to fit our efforts to communities to adjust to what communities need and to make it real and to make the support and the efforts that we bring to this whole cause real support for local police. The police are on the front lines. Our policing initiative will increase the number of police on the streets and address community needs. It's not just about catching criminals, because we want to catch the bad ones and send them away and have enough prison cells to put them away, but it's preventing crimes from occurring in urban, rural, or suburban areas throughout America. And I want to emphasize a concern about rural areas. Too many sheriffs have told me, you forget about us. We can't forget about rural America because the crime problem there is as difficult. Our policing initiative will target funds to localities most in need. We will provide incentives for communities to develop locally designed long-term public safety plans. And the program has the flexibility necessary to respond to the changing policing needs of localities and to reward effective innovation. Policing is not enough, though, and the police officers would be the first to tell you this. If we're serious about fighting crime, we must also be serious about keeping guns out of the hands of criminals. You simply can't solve the crime problem if you don't begin to address the gun problem. Passing the Brady Bill is essential, and this administration is con committed, as the President has indicated, to doing what it takes to get this measure enacted as quickly as possible. Deadly assault weapons, which were developed to wage wars, are turning our streets into battlegrounds. They have no place in civilian hands and we will work to pass a ban on these weapons. We intend to work with Congress on prompt passage of all of our crime initiatives. The presence here today of state attorneys general and the National District Attorneys Association provide strong evidence that we can succeed. I'd like to introduce you 
uh, to Charles Burson, the Attorney General of Tennessee, Charles Oberly of Delaware, Jim Doyle of Wisconsin, and I will be calling on Mike Moore in just a moment. Also present with us is Bob Macy and Newman Flanagan of the National District Attorneys Association, and I thank you so much for being here. I will now call and, and just ask each of them to speak in succession on people who have been instrumental in helping us get to this point today. It was six months ago that I stood in this garden and got nominated, and one of the people who has had one of the greatest, in, two of the people that have had the greatest influence on my life, except for the two people standing behind me, are Senator Joe Biden and Chairman Jack Brooks. Mike Moore, the Mississippi Attorney General, William O'Malley, the District Attorney, from Plymouth County, Massachusetts, and the President of the National District Attorneys Association, and Bill Bratton, the Commissioner for the Boston Police Department. Chairman Biden. Thank you, General, and you have my sympathies. If Jack Brooks had an influence on you, I apologize for that. I've learned several things, Mr. President. Uh, in the years I've worked on the crime bill, but none more than I have the last, uh, the last uh, eight months. The thing I most learned about the President of the United States is he starts uh, work early in the morning and he continues to work until after 11.30 at night. My wife can testify to that. On six occasions since you've become President, you've called me after 11.30 p.m. in my home and said, Biden, where's the crime bill? That is true six different times. Well, I hope we're going to get you a crime bill, Mr. President. And let me suggest that I think this press conference is about three things. It's about keeping promises, it's about keeping faith, and it's about cooperating. The President made a promise. He made a promise when he ran for President of the United States and became President that he would put aside the political rhetoric about crime and try to sit down and settle the ideological differences that have divided us to get a real live crime bill. He's kept that promise and continues to keep it. It's about keeping faith, keeping faith with the American people. They know we can do a great deal about crime, and they know it's used as a political football, and they, in fact, expect us to do more than just talk about it. And it's about cooperation. This unlikely cast of characters off to my left here were brought together in my office by the Attorney General of my state who said something to the effect, Joe, no, they really will cooperate if you just talk to them. Because for three years, all those folks standing back there have been united on a crime bill. We've all known exactly what we wanted in a crime bill. These folks over here have had some legitimate disagreements about parts of it. We sat down and for six months, including this guy with a string bow tie who I wouldn't want to be in his county if I got arrested, uh, sat down and we came up with a solution to the thorniest of all the problems that's kept us from happening, something the American public does not have that much interest in but has divided us, and that's a thing called habeas corpus, and we settled it. So, Mr. President, for the first time in the 20 years I've been in the United States Senate, you have Democrats and Republicans, an administration of Congress, the prosecutors as well as the police officers, in unison on 99.9 percent .9 of what you want to get done. And lastly, there are three things. There are three things we know. And there are only three things we know about crime. Unfortunately, we know that younger and younger people are committing more violent crimes in America. When I got here at age 29, the most violent offenders in America were 18 years, three months old. Now the most violent offenders in America are 15 years, four months old. There's a reason for it, and something has to be done. And one of the reasons is we have not addressed the juvenile justice system. We've ignored it. This crime bill focuses on youth, focuses on how to keep them from getting into the system. There's been a major report today in the major newspapers of America on violence in America among youth. There are answers to dealing with the problem, and it starts with dealing with our youth. The second thing that's in this, led, the second thing we know is a policeman on a corner makes a difference. The more cops there are in the street, the less likely you are to be victimized. We are going to start off with 55,000 police officers immediately toward that 100,000 police person commitment and state and local commitment. This is not a federal problem. It's not a local problem. It's a national problem, and the states and localities are left carrying too much of the water. This makes the focus on a cooperative effort. And the last thing we know is that certainty makes a difference. Certainty and punishment. 
certainty in being able to carry out the punishment. And that's why we have in here more money for boot camps, more money for those who go through the system and after appeals are exhausted or convicted, that they in fact go to jail. And we know that drugs continue to plague this nation. And we know that criminals in the system, convicted criminals, are abusers in the system. We know they get let out of the system still abusing drugs. We know that they are account for the vast majority of the violent crime in America. This legislation does something about that. And lastly, we finally focus a little on victims. You know, one of the reasons I think the American public is so cynical about the crime problem is because we don't pay nearly enough attention to the victims of the crime. We don't acknowledge their pain. We don't acknowledge the tragedy they've gone through. The system is not designed to do it. We're going to remake the system so that it's victim friendly, so that they have a stake in the outcome of this process. And guns are part of the problem. And the President has committed, and I commit, and we all commit, to pass the Brady Bill as passed by the United States Congress in the conference report, a Brady Bill that's real. And a Brady bill, in my view, Mr. President, I know you agree with me, a Brady bill that doesn't have to wait for the whole crime bill. We should pass the Brady bill right away, separate and apart from everything else, and get underway. I thank you all very much, and I thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Chairman, and while Mr. Chairman is coming up, I'd like to recognize Mayor Sharon Pratt Kelly of the District of Columbia. Welcome, Mayor. Mayor. Here. Well, let me just say thank you for those very brief remarks, Mr. Biden. <laughs> I want to praise the President for keeping the, his own deep commitment to fighting the scourge of crime that has threatened our streets and our homes and our very lives for far too long. And it's time to fight crime with actions, not slogans. It may be hard, very hard for some of groups to let go of, of what they perceive to be a wonderful issue. But our streets are flowing with blood. The American public doesn't want any more words that fly ever so lightly into the air, signifying nothing. They're tired of politicians vying with each other to prove just who's tougher on crime. They're especially tired of the purists among us who want 100% or nothing. Now, with the President and the Attorney General's strong support, Senator Biden and I will finally break this deadly cycle. For it is deadly not to have more cops on the beat. It is deadly not to deter heinous crimes with appropriately severe punishments. And it is deadly to release prisoners back into the streets who are still drug dependent. Now, last Congress, the crime bill report was historic both in scope and approach. Without question, it was the toughest crime bill to emerge since the federal government was forced to take drastic action uh, in the 20s and 30s. This bill did not stop. It contained a host of programs to prevent new crimes against persons and property, the type of prevention sorely lacking in past efforts in the 80s. Yet for all its unyielding refusal, to coddle criminals. It did not trample on the basic constitutional protections that make this country a nation ruled by laws and not by mob passions. The House passed the crime bill on October the 21st of 91. The Senate did it November the 21st, about a month later, of 91. We went to conference November the 24th of 91. We <clears throat> passed the conference report in the House of Representatives November the 27th of 91. And when the conference moved over to the Senate, a group of obstructionist Republicans decided it was somehow better to deny the American public a victory on crime than to acknowledge the fundamental soundness of this democratic crime bill. They bottled up the bill for almost 11 months now this Congress, the President has unmistakably extended a hand to Republicans not to delay, to join in our efforts together to fight crime. We'll see how they respond 
We'll know their actions by their votes. I'd like to call on Attorney General Mike Moore of Mississippi, who has been working with Senator Biden and Chairman Brooks in every way possible. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Good to see you guys. Thank you very much, General Reno. And I'll give you greetings from the great state of Mississippi and tell you it's a pleasure for a Mississippi boy to be here in the Rose Garden at the White House. I'd like to offer a sincere thank you to President Clinton and Attorney General Reno, Chairman Biden and Chairman Brooks, indeed everyone here, especially the real American heroes behind me, for their involvement that produced this excellent initiative. The leadership that we have seen as attorneys general in this country exhibited has kept everyone involved in the efforts to produce an anti-crime package and has helped us move forward in this process that has gone on for too long, Senator Biden. I particularly appreciate very much the hands-on personal involvement of this attorney general, Janet Reno, and this chairman, Chairman Biden. I can remember many meetings that we were in when you stayed for four, five, and, and six hours. And General Reno, I don't know how many hours you've stayed, and you've called us at 12 o'clock. Uh, in the middle of the night about this thing. We've really got people that are committed to this, and I don't know that I've seen the like in my career of 16 years. Such personal commitment is certainly uncommon in these very busy times. The initiative we announced today is the product of hard work, tough compromises, tough compromises, effective leadership, and difficult balances. But it's met the test of all these challenges and we have a bill that is much better than where Congress left off last year. It's more effective for the law enforcement community, a goal, Mr. President, we must attain. Several portions of this initiative in particular will resonate with state and local law enforcement officials across this country. The American public, in our estimation, is so frustrated with the seemingly never-ending criminal justice system. We need finality, but we need fairness. And the habeas reform portion of this bill promotes just that. Mr. President, I'm also very impressed, especially coming from my small state, with the many provisions of this legislation that follow through on your commitment to provide help to the local level, where 95% of all crime in this country is investigated and prosecuted. Promoting community policing, regional prisons and boot camps that actually house state prisoners, and the emphasis on rural crime and drugs puts for the first time in my career real meaning to the phrase, we're the federal government and we're here to help you. <laughs> Mr. President, this country needs an effective crime bill. Everyone wants to pass a bill that will help Americans feel secure in their homes, their schools, and their neighborhoods. Today's announcement goes a long way toward making that hope a reality. You have my personal thanks and the thanks of all these gentlemen throughout this country. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to call on a local prosecutor. I know how hard your job is. William O'Malley, the district attorney from Plymouth County, Massachusetts, representing the National District Attorneys Association. The members of the National District Attorneys Association are Democrats and Republicans. They're liberals, they're moderates, they're conservatives. They come from every community in this great country of ours. First and foremost, they're prosecutors. As prosecutors, we know exactly what we are against. We are against the crime that plagues so many communities in our great country. And for two years, we were against legislation that, in our judgment, would seek fairness. Whether it achieved it or not, we doubted, but at the expense of never-ending litigation, such that the victims of crimes could never heal, could never end the grieving process, could never get on with their lives, such that, in our opinion, we could never devote our resources to the new crime that greeted each day, but again and again had to litigate cases that we had tried 10, 15, 20 years in the past. A local prosecutor was appointed attorney general of this great country. 
And Mr. President, we thank you for Janet Reno. Janet Reno met with us and said, okay, I know what you're against. What are you for? It was a novel question for us in a way. <laughs> She asked us to articulate in a positive, affirmative way the legislation that we could support that dealt with the very complex, arcane issue of habeas corpus reform. We went to Senate uh, Chair of the Judiciary Committee, uh, Senator Joseph Biden's office. I was personally very impressed. With no advance warning, we were invited to his office at 4 in the afternoon. We were still at the table at 9 o'clock at night. In that first session, we made very real progress in addressing the issues that had led prosecutors to oppose the crime package for two years. Uh, what followed was a, a very long negotiation uh, that staff on uh, every side participated in. At that table were the Senate Judiciary staff, the National District Attorneys Association staff, representatives of the staff of the House Judiciary Committee, the National Association of Attorneys General, the Department of Justice. It was truly a first. There truly was cooperation. There truly was communication. It was painful at times. And I agree, it did produce a bill that is the very best bill on habeas that is possible. It is important for this country that we do all in our power without regard to party or position or ideology to deal with the rising crime of violence. In the county of Plymouth, Massachusetts, where I have been the district attorney for many years, the rate of murder has almost doubled. And the age of the defendants that I am seeing in court has gone down and down. We must deal effectively after the fact in the investigation and prosecution of crime. We must as well do all in our power before that crime is committed in a manner similar to what DARE has accomplished with drugs to address the problems of violence in juveniles as well. It is a real privilege, a real honor to be here today. And uh, I thank you, Senator Biden. I thank you, uh, Janet Reno. And I thank you, Mr. Clinton. Thank you very much. I now would like to call on Bill Bratton, the Commissioner of the Boston Police Department. Welcome, Commissioner. In my uh, best Boston accent, adding to all the various accents that have already spoken before me, as an American police chief, I'd like to say thank you to the President, the members of Congress, the Attorney General, and all those who have worked to get these two pieces, these two initiatives, to this point. But I have another message, and that message is quite clear. This time, let's get it done. The American people need this legislation. <laughs> and not just the American people, but America's police, as represented by those behind me. I've been in this business for 23 years, and for the first time, I'm sensing a fear among American police forces, and a fear in my city, Boston, where homicides have gone up 60% this year as a result of gang violence and domestic violence, a fear that we are losing, that we are losing the streets. We need help. We need it fast. We need the Brady gun bill now. And very quickly behind it, we need this legislation. Clear and simple, the American police working as partners with American citizens and the government will get the job done if given the resources. We will fight for every house. We will fight for every street. We will fight for every block. We will fight for every city. And we will win if given the resources, if given the opportunity, if given the support. It's that simple. Let's get it done and let's get it done now. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Let's go to work. Good job, man. Great job. Great job. Thanks for your patience.